Charlotte Harbor National Estuary Program is a partnership to protect our estuaries from Venice to Bonita Springs. An estuary is where fresh water from the land mixes with the salt water from the sea. We call estuaries by other names including bay, harbor, bayou, sound, pass, and bite. Charlotte Harbor Estuary also includes the tidal portion of the Mayaka, Peace, and Caloosahatchee Rivers, as well as the tidal portions of many creeks. An estuary is so important because they call it the nursery of the sea, where all of the babies are born in the ocean. And that's things as simple as shrimp and fish that we eat, going all the way up to the chain to the dolphins and the manatees. Everything starts in the estuary. We have salt water coming in from the Gulf of Mexico and we will have fresh water and all of those mixed together back in the bay in the estuary and depending on where you are the salinity will vary and that also varies depending on the type of year and the tide level as well. So many animals need to use the estuary at some time in their lives. There are only a few places where the sea grasses and the mangroves provide the shelter and the food that all these sea creatures need. So we need to protect them. You have what we call the food web and if all those things are interconnected and if you have um, a quote-unquote higher animal feeding on a smaller animal and that smaller animal for some reason disappears or you know, goes away or vanishes from that area. That predator that needs that type of food prey will have trouble itself. So it's all connected. Join us on a virtual wading trip and meet 17 of our local experts who will introduce you to some of the animals that live in the waters of our estuaries. From the big to the small, to the very, very small, all play an important role in maintaining a healthy environment. Some of the animals that you're most likely to see and notice in an estuary are called our megafauna, and all that means is our large critters, our large animals that you see. And we do have quite a few here in our estuaries in southwest Florida. Any reason a megafauna or any animal would live in an area is they're looking for primary things such as food, shelter, and space. So here we have things like bottlenose dolphins, which we have resident populations, and we also have populations that come in from offshore. And they're here predominantly for food and space. We have multiple species of sharks. Probably the most common that you would see is the bull shark which is a really fascinating critter because it can actually live in fresh water and it uses our estuaries for the same reasons other ones would do for food and space and also as a nursery ground so it's looking a little bit at shelter. You can't really mention megafauna in estuaries without bringing up manatees. Manatees are an endangered species. They do spend the majority of their life in inland waters, in estuaries, in lagoons, in bays. Their predominant food source is veg they're vegetarian. So they eat algae, they eat seagrasses, they eat any plant life they can find. They raise their babies in estuaries. We do have a few species of sea turtles. The most common ones you would see in a place like a bay like this would be our loggerhead sea turtle which uses our beaches for nesting and then uses our estuaries for feeding and a little bit for shelter. And then the green sea turtle, which will spend a lot of its time here in our estuaries, again, looking for food or shelter. They are both listed on the endangered species list. About 75 to 95 percent of our recreationally and commercially important fish species spend part of their life cycle here. We have fishing, kayaking, boating, all sorts of fun stuff people like to do, which fuels our tourism. Popular sport fish, such as snook, tarpon, redfish, sea basses, and grouper, live in estuarine waters, both as juveniles and adults, making Charlotte Harbor an internationally renowned sport fishing destination. A lot of times when we're back here mucking around, um, pulling out these little tiny fish, people ask us, you know, what are you doing, why does it matter? And a lot of the people who ask that are fishermen. And the thing that we tell them first right off is that if you like to fish for snook or tarpon or even redfish, if it wasn't for these creeks and all the little fish back here, there would be no snook or tarpon or redfish. Juvenile snook and tarpon, for example, depend on creeks just like the one that's behind me. If we lose those creeks and all the little fish in them, we're going to lose our fisheries. A mainstay in these creeks is the gambusia or mosquito fish, which you have right here. That's a female. They're live bearers. They don't lay eggs like a lot of other fish. They actually have give live birth and looks like she's starting to get a little bit fat. You can see they have kind of a pointy snout and the mouth opens on the surface. They do a lot of feeding on the surface. This is a sailfin molly. It's another common species back in these creeks. You can see the long lines of dots that go down the side. This is a female. It's very plain. If it's a male, that dorsal fin becomes very large and extended and has some nice blue highlights on it. 
We've recorded around 50 different species in these creeks. Some are juveniles, and then they move out of the creeks into the estuary as they grow. Others are lifelong residents, like the killifish and the mosquito fish. For every big snook, trophy snook that people catch, there's got to be thousands of little snook back in these creeks. After a year or so, they start to move out of the creeks, and after two years, they become mature. So the first year, year and a half, these creeks are it. Without these creeks, we lose our fisheries. All rivers lead to the sea, but we really can't have all these, these species without the influx between the river and the ocean. So just the animals that are out there, it's, every time I go out and collect, it's a new surprise for me. You have mollies, they're sailfin mollies that you can find all the way up river, all the way down river in full fresh or full salt, and they really don't care where they're at. A lot of the killifish and the smaller fish that you find in the sand flats that whenever you're out and you're looking down and you, oh, there's minnows and baits, those are the fish that you're seeing, the ones that can handle that really severe temperature change and salinity change. The mullet use the river, they're vegetarian fish. They actually have a gizzard like a bird does. So they, they use the river as a feeding location. They come up and eat a lot of the vegetation here. And they also um, mass in the waters here and then spawn out at sea. There's uh, over 270 species of fish on the harbor. And uh, probably about 90% of those are uh, you know, what we consider like forage base. The fish that we're used to catching, the redfish and the snook, represent about 5% of what's out here. The vast majority are represented just by a few species. And uh, we got some of the forage type species in here. So here's the pinfish, probably the most abundant species in the harbor, one of the most abundant and also one of the most important in terms of prey for larger species. So this is a pigfish, it's in the grunt family. And again, it spawns offshore, uses the estuary as a nursery habitat and it'll move off at a larger size. This is a pipefish, and it's related to the seahorses. It lives in the uh, seagrass beds, and you can see that it makes for good camouflage. It looks like a seagrass blade. And so it hides there in the grass, and it slurps down small invertebrates you know, that are living in the seagrass. This is a silver jenny, which is very common in the harbor. This is the file fish, and it uses the uh, seagrass beds. You can tell it's green in color. They're pretty abundant in the seagrasses, and they, you know, a lot of things eat them. <laughs> this is a black sea bass. It uses the uh, seagrass habitats in Charlotte Harbor as a nursery also. And it'll move offshore, and fishermen target this species sort of in the near shore, five miles offshore. Some of the large fish, like the spotted sea trout, it lives in the estuary year-round. So the estuary is its home. So they're taking advantage of these species that are coming into the estuary for short periods of time, you know, just to grow as juveniles. And so they have a constant food supply. The seagrass beds provide cover, you know, a place for them to hide, and a rich food source. These grass shrimp are a good example of that, of uh, the types of fit species that live in the grass that provide food uh, for, the, uh, for the larger fish. These are third grade classes from Littleton Elementary, and as part of their unit of study, when they study the web of life, they learn about producers and consumers and how the ecosystems all work together. One of the favorites is the little pygmy seahorse. It's only this big, and usually we find at least one of those. They're very difficult to find because they're so well camouflaged in the seagrass, but we almost always find one. They should be able to find different kinds of puffer fish and other small fish out there that eat the shrimp and they'll find lots of different kinds of shrimp. There are grass shrimp and pink shrimp, all different sizes. Some of them are bright green, some of them are brown, some of them are almost clear. This is a tongue fish, similar to a flounder in that one eye migrates to the other side of its body. So both eyes are on its left side. We've found out that goliath groupers can only grow up if they have mangrove roots to live in as babies. The leaves from the mangrove trees fall down and they provide detritus that's the base of the food chain for all the shrimp and the shrimp of course are food for a lot of the different creatures. The spider crab. So here they are. We've had these in the classroom. You know they've got glue for spit. So they'll lick the grass and they stick it on and it gives them a camouflage covering. They're always checking their hairdo to see if they're bald anywhere. They'll pick some more grass, lick it, and stick it on. Many commercially important crustaceans, commonly referred to in restaurants as shellfish, spend part of their lives in estuaries. 
These crustaceans can include familiar animals, such as crabs, lobsters, crayfish, and shrimp. While adults may migrate offshore to breed and spawn, their eggs, which develop into larvae, usually drift back into the estuary with the tides. Here, the shallow water, salt marshes, sea grasses, and mangrove roots provide a perfect place to hide from larger predators. A lot of juvenile stone crabs start off here in the estuary. They live in the grass, they feed off the grass and the plankton and algae and everything. There's a lot for them to eat and good places for them to hide. We catch a lot of little ones out catching bait or stuff. You'll catch juveniles in here in the estuaries. They start out like the size of your little fingernail. And uh, I think the bigger they get, they, they go offshore and live in hard rock bottom. But you do catch a few in the grassy areas and in the estuaries and around the mangroves and they travel. This guy here, he's, a, he's the king of the crabs around here. You can only harvest the claws. This is a horseshoe crab. He's got eyes there and they, I believe them are eyes there too, just you can barely see them. These are really prehistoric creatures. On a full moon, I've seen them out here before, hundreds of them up on like sand banks or oyster bars they get up there to, to mate. You have a flounder? Uh -huh. All right, let's put some water on him so he doesn't drown, I mean die. And yeah, these students really enjoy being out here. They chose to come out here and participate in this because they realize how important it is for the people in the state to learn and know about estuaries. We have found a very large blue crab out here today. Charlotte Harbor is well known for blue crabs. It produces a lot of blue crabs that are sold throughout the country. Do you know what these things are called right here? They're called swimmerettes. Now most crabs walk along the bottom. They can't swim up in the water. But these are flattened out legs that make the blue crab or gives the blue crab the ability to swim in the water. You know what these things are that are sticking out underneath uh, right there where my finger's pointing? You know what that is? It's eye? It's eye, that's right. Crabs have eyes out on stalks, and you can see that they can stick those eyes out. Of course, when you rub the sea grasses across it, they pull their eyes back in. They need a certain amount of salinity in the water, not full ocean water salinity necessarily, and not totally fresh water, but the estuary provides this mixture of some salt and some fresh water, and that's why estuaries are so productive. They're one of the most productive habitats in the world. The blue crab claws are the main thing that the people eat from the blue crabs. The blue crabs are also called soft shell crabs because when they molt or they lose their shell, it takes them about a day or two to grow a new shell in. And so while they're in that soft stage, then they can be taken and cooked. They're known as soft shell crabs at that point. Sometimes you'll find blue crabs with barnacles growing on them, which means that their shell actually provides a habitat for other life forms. Like I said, a lot of the stuff out here is going to be small because these are going to be younger. So we're going to be looking for shrimp, which is sort of the basis of the food chain out here. Everybody loves to eat shrimp, but we'll also look for hermit crabs. Another animal that we have living in under the sea here is the hermit crab. And these are a type of animal that actually is unlike the blue crabs and the spider crabs that have a hard exoskeleton. The hermit crab has a soft body and has to be able to find an empty shell in which to live. And it will crawl in backwards and hold on with its back legs to hold on to the shell. And as it grows, it will have to exit the shell that it's living in and find a larger shell to live in. These guys are a type of animal called a detritivore, which means that they help to eat, a, eat the detritus, all the decaying vegetation that's on the bottom. Marine gastropods, more commonly known as sea snails or sea slugs, play an important role in the estuarine ecosystem, where they feed on decaying organisms and decaying organic matter known as detritus, while providing food for larger animals. Many of them are known for their beautiful shells. This is the banded tulip snail, again another univalve. And you can see the animal here is black and white speckled. And they can be found in the seagrass beds. They are carnivorous, so they crawl along and they can eat decaying shrimp or anything that they can catch, as well as other mollusks and univalves, like banded tulip snails. See, he's got his hole. He's trying to flip himself over. That's the fighting conch. Thank you. You can see he's got his two eye stalks there and the big muscular foot. These guys are carnivores. They're univalves, which means they have one shell, they're a type of mollusk. And he's trying to turn his whole shell over is what he's trying to do. This one's not quite as aggressive. But they can use that foot to turn themselves over. And a lot of them, just like their name suggests, they can be um, cannibalistic as well, so they can fight and try to pull each other out of the shells with that foot. This is a lightning whelk, and it's named that from these little stripes of color that are running down the shell. The animal is the black part right in there, the muscle. 
and this little hard shell right here is called the operculum. That's what they use for prote protection when they crawl into their shell. That covers up the opening, so it's harder for predators to get in there. These guys are a type of mollusk called a univalve, and they crawl along the bottom using a big muscular foot. The salinity level affects the gastropods and the mollusks um, in the fact that they have to be able to put up with this high levels of salinity. When we get a lot of freshwater source input coming in, they have to be able to put up with that low salinity as well. So they can tolerate a higher fluctuation of salinity, more so than maybe some of the fish and some of the other crustaceans, just because they do have that protective shell on them. With gastropods, they will lay different types of egg casings. This particular egg casing is one for a lightning whelk. Now, what will happen is the female will lay the string, and then she will put out through the egg slit many cells. And each one is attached. This can take up to 10 to 14 days and can have be about two and a half to three feet long. And it looks like a slinky in the water. It kind of uh, undulates. It starts out at this size. It metabolizes the food, and it grows, and it metabolizes the food and grows. So it gets larger and larger and larger. So once the baby is hatched, it will eat usually what we call zooplankton, microscopic material, and it metabolizes the food. And when it metabolizes the food, it takes part of that and creates the shell. And literally the shell grows around the animal. All right. So here is the baby at the top, and there's the baby shell at the top. This is usually the aha moment when people realize that they develop, they don't change shells. Most people think that they move from shell to shell. Once they're hatched, they stay in the shell for their entire life. This is what they call a sea hare. I'm going to bring him out, and you can get a good look at what they thought was a rabbit. Now, I always say that uh, this particular animal that lives on the edges of the estuary, they come in and they lay their egg strings in the springs. Eons ago, this particular creature had a shell, like a gastropod that you just saw with the lightning whelk. So this creature developed its body and only has a remnant of the ancient shell in here, inside the wings. But it is able to live and survive for all these millions of years without the shell. Now you notice the wings that I'm pushing back and forth. This is how it flies. Ooh. And by fly, I mean through the water. <laughs> but this is a nudibranch. It eats, it's a bottom feeder, and it's basically found in the seagrass beds. When people come out here to the estuary, they ex expect to see the big animals, the megafauna, such as the dolphin, the manatee, without realizing when they go off into the seagrasses, they're going to find juveniles, important species. So they really don't have that connect that the small things have to be out there in the seagrass to provide them with these larger things that they really associate normally with the estuaries. So these are tunicate, okay? A tunicate is a colonial animal. This is, there's as many animals living together, like a sponge, like a coral. There's many different species. This is just one of them. They're naturally occurring out here in the estuary. However, you do see that it attaches itself to seagrass often. This is some turtle grass. They're also in filter feeders. They take in water. They release water. So they're good for the environment. However, they are indications of high nutrient load. We see more of these in the summertime whenever people are fertilizing their lawns. A sea squirt is another type of tunicate. Uh, they obviously take in water and expel water. He looks like a little brain. Okay. He does. <laughs> he he does, does. Doesn't he? <laughs> like a banana brain. Like a banana brain? Yeah, yeah. Squirt <laughs> it squirts out right there. See its little mouth right there? See the little hole? And you gently squeeze it. One thing that we make sure that people do do when they come out on these wading trips is that they first release the animals unharmed back into the seagrass where they got them. I press that this is the habitat of these animals, of the wildlife, and they need to go back to their neighborhood. Mostly what we're going to see in these touch tanks are our invertebrate animals. And those are the ones that, of course, don't have a spine. What we're looking at here is our sea star, more commonly known by a lot of you as our starfish. Now this animal right here crawls along the bottom and they're very unique animals. They feed on bivalves for the most part. And what they do is they wrap those five legs around where the bivalve would come together there. 
They wrap their legs around there and they can attach all of those suction cup feet onto the outer edges of the bivalve. And right in the middle there you can see there's a very small star. That's where all those legs have come together. That is its mouth. In its mouth there, right behind there, is its stomach organ and it has the ability to push its stomach out of its mouth. From there it will digest the bivalve and then it will kind of take in that nice nutrient rich soup of compounds and it's going to ingest all of that. This is what we call our rough pen shell. It's a species of bivalve. What it's doing out there is it's drawing water into its body and it's filtering out micro plants or phytoplanktons that grow naturally here in this water. They're microscopic. It's filtering those out of the water there and basically that's how it gains its nutrients and it lives in the sand just like so, like we're seeing it. It doesn't move around out there. These invertebrates make up largely uh, the bottom rungs of that food web out there and so by keeping those populations healthy we in turn allow those top parts of the food chain to really thrive thus keeping the anglers happy, our fishing that we have out in the Gulf of Mexico keeping those nice and strong as well. So. Bivalves are a group of marine and freshwater mollusks that have two hinged shells. Many are familiar for their gastronomic appeal, such as scallops, mussels, clams, and oysters, while shell collectors may be more familiar with talons or angel wings. The scallops live in, among the seagrass. Um, they start off as larvae. They're pelagic when they spawn, and they'll travel in the currents for a couple of weeks. Once they get large enough, they will find a place to attach, usually the blade of seagrass. And as they develop, they drop off the seagrass and they grow on the floor of the seagrass beds. The one on my left is a bay scallop. So that's the one we typically find in our bays. The one on the right is the calico scallop. This is the one you would typically find along the beach. Although bay scallops can turn this color, they're easily confused the two because they basically look the same. The bay scallops also have iridescent eyes and you'll recognize them as you're swimming over the seagrass beds. You'll look down and you can see the iridescent eyes as they filter the water as they're feeding. And when you swim over them, they're light sensors. And so the scallops will immediately close up or they'll sense a prey and they'll try to elude the prey by, by opening and closing quickly and then expelling the water and moving away. The reason they're important to the estuary is because they um, are very sensitive to pollution, changes in salinity, siltation that comes off the land. So they're a good indicator species of what's happening in the environment. Oyster reefs are especially important because oysters filter enormous amounts of water, anywhere from 4 to 40 liters per oyster per hour. And that clears all the bacteria, uh, detritus, phytoplankton, contaminants, and so on and so forth. And it promotes the growth of seagrasses. These are juvenile oysters about two to three months old. We spawned them earlier this year for uh, restoration purposes. These are adult sized oysters that we use for brood stock. What you see in the field are probably something along this side. As you know, the Southwest Florida region is extremely important in recreational fishery. Uh, people come here to fish for um, uh, redfish, snook, and so on and so forth. And these species directly depend on oyster reefs for their food. Sea urchins are important components of coastal regions. They eat macroalgae, etc., that grows right offshore. And so they are an important top-down control for a macroalgae, for example. Any impacts on organisms such as sea urchins would have repercussions for the macroalgae because in terms of storms, etc., they get tend to uh, wash the shore. And given that this area is heavily tourism dependent, large amounts of macroalgae washing up, etc., is probably not very uh, beneficial for the tourism industry. We have um, some relatively large bivalves that filter feed for microscopic plant in the water or phytoplankton, as we call that. Um, and uh, a good example will be uh, the angel wing. It's a very spectacular bivalve with very wide shells that can be found you know, burrowing deep in the mud. And what they do is they suck the water from the surface of the bottom and they filter the water for the food they're interested in. And whatever they don't like, they spit out through their uh, rear end, if you will. At another level, you have your scavengers, you know, animals that will eat decomposing dead other animals. In the mud flats, we have the mud snails. The mud snails are very interesting because once something dies and begins to rot in the water, they can detect that rotten smell dissolved in the water and they can zero in onto that body and move in large numbers and eventually in a few hours 
completely consume that. The top predator in the muddy uh, bottom here, on the muddy bottoms, is the horse conch. It is the largest snail in the Atlantic Ocean. And it's also the Florida state shell. So basically it's like the lion in Africa. It does eat a lot of large animals, but it's not eaten by anyone. Talons are very interesting because they are deposit feeders. They, they lie um, sideways on the mud bottom, slightly buried, and their siphon sticks out and they filter the very film of decomposing goo that's sitting on top of the bottom. Underwater, but on top of the bottom. So they suck that in. It's a very uh, nutritious little soup. So they feed on all the decomposing film of bacteria and whatever is there. The mud or sandy sediments at the bottom of the estuary are often referred to as the benthos. Here live many of the animals that form the base of the ocean food chain. Most people go to the beach or the estuary and they look at the fish, they look at the birds and other things. But if you're waiting around in an area like this in the shallow waters or the intertidal areas, you might not think about there are thousands of animals that are under each step of your foot. They live on and in the mud of the estuary. They're one of the major and most important components of the estuary because they perform a very fundamental service of critical importance. They are the primary trophic transfer organisms in an estuary. So they transfer energy from primary production through the animal kingdom up to the larger animals such as fish and crabs. So without that component, you would not have those higher organisms. There are literally dozens of different phyla, major groups of animals that live on the benthos. And this would include things like polychaete worms. We have crabs. There's sea urchins. There's a large group of animals known as crustaceans, and they crawl around the surface and graze on the detritus and plant material. But if the benthos were to collapse in any particular system, it has a dramatic effect on all the other organisms. People have a role to play in protecting these animals and our estuaries, the water that is their home, by not taking too many of them, by not harassing them, and by not polluting their homes. One of the most popular activities when visitors come to Florida beaches is shelling. We just ask that people be aware they are living creatures. If it even seems like they might be alive, please return them to the environment, return them to the sand as close to the water as you can. Don't throw them into the water. They are sensitive creatures. These young people live in the watershed, and so whatever they do in their yard is going to impact this estuary. If we want them to be good stewards of the land and good stewards of the water, they need to understand what's at stake. So they need to see all the creatures that live here and how valuable they are and how interesting they are. Because you only conserve what you love, you only love what you understand, and you only understand what you've been taught. What any individual can do is just to, to pay attention to a lot of the initiatives that are already going. There's a lot of uh, involvement, checking your septic tank, making sure that it's in good shape, um, and getting people on sewer where possible. Uh, other things are um, a lot of the fertilizer ordinances. Um, there's very good reason for that going into place. It can really help keep our water clean if we can use just the right of nutrients that we need in our daily lives and not too much. Now, more than ever, it's important for people to get involved with the, with the estuary programs, the nonprofits, to do habitat restoration because it's so much easier to prevent the pollution from hitting the estuary than it is to try and clean it up once it's reached the estuaries. You know, getting in in the plantings, planting native Florida species, picking up trash, that's the best way to help the estuaries is getting involved, getting your hands dirty. We keep talking about how productive it is and all what people see are the bigger animals or the things flying in the air. They don't think about the sea grasses underneath and the importance of them. You think about your grass on your lawn and your flowers, but what about the grasses under the water and how that makes that nursery, how they can hide and be protected in the grasses, how the manatees need those grasses to eat and how everything's connected, if it's habitat or if it's food, water quality, everything under the water is so important. You've just heard from 17 local experts about a few of the many species of animals that live in the waters of our estuaries and the habitat that they depend on, as well as some suggestions for ways to keep them and their homes healthy. If you would like to learn more about our estuaries and these animals that live in them, as well as others not mentioned here, such as the octopus and stingray, visit the Charlotte Harbor National Estuary Program website, which also provides helpful information about ways we can protect both.